Hello? Hello? Uh, good morning. Good morning, uh, Doctor. So now we will, would like to uh, play the video uh, of the presentation of Prof. David Rubin. Yes, please go on. I can't hear you. Maybe because you just so. Video presentation. Actually, it's okay, but I can't hear. Oh, I can't hear anything. They want me to be new. Come on.
I'm sorry, I can, you can hear, see the fellow talking on the day with the presentation, but I'm told that when I can't hear anything, the maximum you can. Sorry? Mute, mine, mine, mute. Wait, uh, But if we were to do a algorithmic search of words describing what we do in journals and in articles and in interviews and in papers and in etc cetera, et cetera, in conferences and webinars, okay. seminars and symposium, okay. the words that would have been in the center of that algorithmic search, that word map from 2001, the World the Tax on the World Trade Center, to about 2011, let's say to March. 11th, 2000. Uh, excuse me, uh, very sorry for the inconvenience cause. Uh, we will replay the video again since uh, it was unmuted. Very sorry for the inconvenience.
Sorry for the interruption. We still can't hear anything. Strategic Risk Crisis Management in all of its myriad aspects. And it is my belief that if we had a greater understanding of and familiarity with that academic work, it would not solve their problems. But what it would do is give them a framework within which they could discuss complex issues, the complex issues that are facing us today. It seems to me that if we are to look at and engage with the risk environment of, let's say, 2022 and soon to be 2023 to, let's say, 2025, which is the immediate term, there are three challenges that we are facing, three pillars, if you like, that supports, drives and underpins the reality of strategic risk and crisis management in all of its myriad aspects. And it is my belief that if they had a greater understanding of and familiarity with that academic work, it would not solve their problems. But what it would do is give them a framework within which they could discuss complex issues, the complex issues that are facing us today. It seems to me that if we are to look at and engage with the risk environment of, let's say, 2022 and soon to be 2023, to let's say 2025, which is the immediate term, there are three challenges that we are facing, three pillars, if you like, that support the structure of strategic risk and crisis management and resilience. The first is complexity. The world is complex. The challenges we are facing are complex. The society we live in is complex. The solutions we need to bring are complex. And the frameworks and structures and the networks and the stakeholders that we need to integrate in order to deal with those problems are also complex. So the first thing is we have to have a not just a realization of complexity, but a comfort of complexity. Complexity is the jungle we live in. We need to feel comfortable there. The second is being unprecedented. That the nature of the, that the problems we're facing are being described as unprecedented. And I'll come to that in a minute. But basically what that means is that our models and frameworks that have worked certainly for the last 30 years and potentially for the last 70 years, really since the end of the Second World War, are now beginning to reach their limit in terms of what they can manage and can engage with, and they are seen to be failing in a radical way. And if the first two pillars are complexity and being unprecedented, then the third pillar is non-recoverable that we are no longer able to understand strategic risk and crisis management or resilience in terms of bouncing back and recovering, but having to deal with the reality of a new normal, a new reality. Post-COVID is just one example of that. But the changing nature of the climate changes, the global warmings, the infrastructure failures, the resource depletion, the pollution, the hyper-urbanization, that we're facing means that we have to accept 
reality of the new reality that we are moving into. I said I would mention something about unprecedentedness. Modern strategic risk and crisis management as we know it today started very clearly on September 11th, 2001, on the day of the world, the attacks on the World Trade Center, the Pentagon and other attack, uh, targets in America. And from our perspective today, the times before 2011, 2001, September 11th, seemed very simple, simpler and, and, and easier, more benign world. But if we were to do a algorithmic search of words describing what we do in journals and in articles and in interviews and in papers and etc cetera, etc cetera, in conferences and webinars seminars and symposiums the word that would have been at the center of that algorithmic search that word map from 2001 the world the tax on the world trade center to about 2011 let's say to march 11th 2011 which was fukushima in japan and the earthquake and the tsunami then the word would have been crisis. Everything was crisis. 2011, or 2001 was crisis, 9 11 was crisis. 2005, Hurricane Katrina was crisis. 2008, the global financial collapse was crisis. 2010, Deepwater Horizon, BP, the Gulf of Mexico was a crisis. And I'm sure that you have, within your own environment and context, crises that happened during that period. And then suddenly in 2011, a new word appeared which is the title of this conference, which is resilient. And suddenly everything was resilient. We had resilient societies, resilient organizations, personal resilience, emotional resilience, community resilience, organizational resilience. And suddenly everybody was an expert in resilience. And I'm sure many of the people in this conference remember suddenly resilience was at the center of what we did. And then in 2017, a new word appeared from absolutely nowhere. And in 2017, the word that appeared from nowhere was unprecedented. And suddenly everything was unprecedented. Unprecedented weather patterns, unprecedented storms, unprecedented droughts, unprecedented fires, unprecedented pollution, unprecedented infrastructure failures, unprecedented data thefts, unprecedented breakdowns of our of our the society we were living in. And if we use the word unprecedented, then that is significant. Because it means that the basic fundamental principles of strategic risk and crisis management or risk management in its basic form have been broken. Because risk management in its basic form has one fundamental foundational belief. And that belief is that we can look to the past, we can model the present, and we can project into the future. There is a continuum, there is a line, there is a rationality which allows us to connect that, what, that which was, that which is, and that which will be. And therefore those projections, of course, they will be changed and there might be radical change, but nevertheless, there is a rationality to it. And if we use the word unprecedented, then it means that that line of continuum, that connectivity, that rationality, has been broken. Now, you may think that we are in unprecedented times. You might equally think, no, we're not in unprecedented times. This is, we're going through a tough time, but the world has always gone through tough time. This is just the tough times of our generation. But if we accept, for the sake of the argument, that we are going through unprecedented times, then the question is, are we going through a paradigm shift? Because one of the signs of a paradigm shift is that the language and the models who used to describe the previous paradigm cannot be used to communicate and discuss the new paradigm. You cannot use the paradigm of a typewriter to discuss the internet. It doesn't transition. And if all that you know is a typewriter, then you cannot conceptualize the internet. And it seems to me that we are trying to use the equivalent of that by using the models of strategic risk management or risk management and resilience 
and all of its other myriad applications. To describe the risk environment of 2022 to 2025 and beyond. And if in fact it is a paradigm shift, then that is a false approach. And so I think that it is a responsibility of us as academics to find a way of finding a language that will allow us to communicate to the world and to policymakers what exactly is going on and what it means and what we can do about it. And if we look at things like COP27, which was just now in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, and before that COP26, and before that all the other COPs, and we look at climate change, then it seems clear that the reality of those risks are not being communicated in an effective manner. So speaking to you as I am in London right now through the miracles of Zoom, to you in Malaysia and to people potentially around the world, it's being streamed. I think that we have a challenge. I think that we as an academic community have a challenge. And that is that we need to understand that on one side of the equation is aspiration and ambition and policy and mission statements and all of those words. We've had politics for 30 years on climate change hasn't really helped us and on pollution and on poverty and everything else we can think of. But if on one side we have all of those words and those aspirations, what it is that we wish to achieve, I believe, each one of you and myself and us as a community, as us individually and us institutionally, we are trying to achieve three things. We are trying to achieve influence. We are trying to achieve impact. And we are trying to achieve legacy. Impact, influence, impact, and legacy. And my belief is that each one of you will probably feel in your heart, yes, that is, that's true. That's, that's what I want to do. I want to have impact, influence, and legacy. And if, in fact, that is what we want to do, then we have to bring something to the game to connect the policy and the aspiration and the mission statements, and then how to create impact, influence, and legacy. And in my opinion, that's what we do. That's what you, and that's what I, and that's what we as a community do. Because what we bring to the game is two things, structure and methodology. And if we bring structure and methodology to the game and bridge those two things, then we create a rational pathway. We create, we create a way of understanding and modeling and engaging and impacting and influencing those issues. And it is my belief that if we are to find a solution to the challenges we are facing, which are significant challenges and very challenging challenges, then the academic community has to make a community, has to make a contribution. It has to make its voice heard. It has to create a platform and a space for practitioners and policymakers and academics and stakeholders to come together and work together to find solutions to these problems that are facing us today and will continue to do so. And it is my belief that it is you, the people in the room right now in this conference, who will be taking up that challenge and that banner and that torch, because if you don't, then who will? And I hope that this will be the start of a meaningful dialogue and interaction and engagement between all of us and I certainly, as somebody who has recently been brought into the ECPD, the European Centre for Peace and Development, and I feel very privileged to have that position, I commit myself to supporting you, to making my voice heard, to try to create a platform where we can genuinely work together to find solutions to the challenges we and the next generation will be facing. Thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. I wish you all well for this uh, conference, and I look forward to seeing where our engagement li might lie in the future. But for now, all the best, and have a wonderful day in the conference. Thank you.
right. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think we can ask David any questions because this was a recorded session. Um, can we call upon uh, Joe uh, to commence as we are running out of time? Absolutely, sure. Okay, so uh, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you for the invitation to uh, to address your your conference, which came uh, to me through uh, Professor Dr. Lindiana Markovic of Belgrade University, and I'm very happy to be um, addressing this conference as uh, organised by by Padana University in association with the ECPD. Um, my name is Joseph Haldane, and I'm the chairman and CEO of IA for the International Academic Forum, which is a Nagoya based, a Japan based organization, but with operations on three continents. We're affiliated with about um, 30 universities around the world, and uh, we have a research center at Osaka University in Japan, which is an international public policy research center. So, um, I'd like to talk to you today on the theme of unlocking resilience, um, and my title is International Cooperation Through Education. So um, in the address today, I thought I'd just pick up on um, a few of the points made by my previous uh, speaker, which in, in what was a, an excellent presentation. And I think the first thing to sort of um, underline is, of course, we've been through um, a huge amount due to the COVID and coronavirus pandemic, um, but we're not done yet. Um, there's still uh, huge lockdowns um, in effect in China. And of course, this is um, something of a test for us because there are two different conceptions of how we want to or of how we might live our lives. And um, I certainly think that um, we don't want to be giving away our civil liberties too easily, particularly in the climates which are um, worrying um, and worryingly authoritarian. Um, IFO is um, an international academic forum. It is dedicated, of course, to providing spaces for, um, for the exchange of ideas along the lines of the international, the intercultural and the interdisciplinary. And we believe this an incredibly important um, uh, mission to be able to do. And um, we're, we're, we're very, very happy to see that um, this conference is also something raising the international, the intercultural and the interdisciplinary. Now, it's incredibly important for us to be able to engage in the academic space, particularly when our local, regional, regional and national governments um, are often uh, taken over by worrying more nationalist um, sort of tendencies and cooperation is sometimes put on the back burner. We saw this during the coronavirus pandemic where um, the developed countries were very, very quick to um, put their, their money and their research money into the provision of uh, vaccines but then they wanted to hoard these vaccines and stop them from uh, stop them from going overseas. So while a lot of the discourse is very, very positive around cooperation, when it actually comes to it, um, you can see that um, uh, it's uh, the, the words don't always match. Then I think the other big um, paradigm shift that's happened within the past few months, and certainly in terms of focus, has been uh, the war in the Ukraine. This has been a, um, a very interesting um, and unsettling um, period in which to view international uh, cooperation. And we uh, at IR4 have had some, some great difficulties in being able to keep spaces that are politically independent because IF4 as an organization wants to be able to be a broad tent and wants to be able to bring in um, views from all around the world. And we believe, of course, um, that uh, where we find um, societies where there, there are not the spaces uh, within the educational institutions for such free speech, we believe it's very, very important. Of course, we have something of a double market there because within um, a lot of what we see in, in the conferences is we see people wishing to present just their own points of view 
and wishing to shut down the points of view of others. Now, perhaps this is a natural uh, human tendency, but part of um, the academic project is really a, uh, a one, that, one that brings together us as humans and that emphasizes the commonality. And one of those um, wonderful things that we do as academics is express different views and ideas and in a way where we we can challenge and have these um, these ideas and views challenged and of course where we can challenge ourselves. It's also worth remembering that the opposite to challenging through um, through words, through argument is physical and is violent. And I think the ECPD uh, at its core um, is obviously dedicated to the assurance of peace. I think perhaps over the past um, few years, we had got perhaps uh, a bit too into the idea of it being the end of history, into being the idea of we're not going to see old fashioned wars anymore. We're going to have a, this march, this endless march towards progress. And yet again, we've seen um, very, very recently with um, with both the Ukrainian war, but also um, with, for example, the, the treatment of the Rohingya people, um, uh, humans who have been treated uh, far, far worse than you would uh, expect to treat humans. And we have to remember that it's an incredibly important place, the educational sphere within civil society, a strong educational sector, a strong tertiary education sector is very, very, very important in the preservation of a strong civic society. Um, I'd also um, like to just move on um, a bit now to present you uh, a, a bit about um, how, how we can sort of, um, how we can justify um, the, the these continued educational spaces, these continued conferences, because some some people see conferences as, as something frivolous, but in actual fact they're deadly serious because they allow for um, ideas to be tested, they allow for ideas to be shared, and they allow for that bridge. And in what this conference is doing is it's bridging between the local and the global. And it's providing a two-way informational street. And of course, this two-way informational street is that which allows you to get better. It's what allows you to be taught, but it's also what allows you to teach us, what allows you in terms of your local knowledge to give to the global and to let everyone know what's going on. That is a, a, a hallmark of a strong society. And of course, what we've seen during the coronavirus pandemic is um, a lot of the uh, skills that uh, we've, we've perhaps taken for, for granted, socialization skills, are skills that, um, that you can't do to the same degree on Zoom or online. Speaking with somebody, uh, smiling at them, gestures, shaking their hands, um, being with them in the same room, sharing a drink with them, sharing food with them. These are all aspects of socialization which um, are, are very, very important within schools and within universities, which are meant to provide safe and nurturing spaces for the exchange of ideas. Now, again, this, uh, these spaces can often come under attack. But it is these very free spaces which are incredibly generative of the ideas which will drive the economies and which will drive the careers of students over the long term. We know that as educators, we must be curators of knowledge and we must um, encourage in our students um, independence of thought and independence um, of in, in terms of research autonomy, which will allow them to not just research and undertake um, a study that is immediately relevant to what they're doing in the moment, but create in them those um, facilities and those faculties that will enable them going forward um, to, um, to be lifelong learners. That is what will help create very, very robust individuals and will be incredibly generative um, societally in terms of the economy. 
And I think it's particularly important that we underline that um, the, um, the usual or the expected lifespan for somebody born this year in 2020 in Japan is going to be an average of over 110 years of age. That's quite an age. So we are already heading into a super aged society. In Japan, the workforce peaked in the mid 1990s. So what you've seen is you've seen um, a society which is getting older and older. And of course, Japan went off that demographic cliff, but it's had to come up with different solutions. And one of the solutions it's been able to undertake very, very well in this world of AI in the society 4.0 is in effect utilize the um the power of those people who are getting older so that they can they can continue to stay relevant and um that is um i think going to be very very important particularly for the younger societies in southeast asia to be able to look to and to look to different models i4 is about bringing together these people um from different places around these these three pillars the international the intercultural and the interdisciplinary i commend the university of padana for what it's doing um in um in this conference and um as my uh, previous speaker said and as i'd like to echo i look forward to ways in which we can continue to work together and to work together with the ecpd in the future thank you very much for your time uh, thank you, uh, Joe. Um, uh, in the interest of time, uh, we'll take uh, a, a very short space for questions, if any, please, or comments. Could I ask the speaker a question? Yes, please. Um, over the last three years, the COVID epidemic made it possible for a, a small country of people in power to control world opinion. And suddenly, um, uh, all this academic freedom and, and the importance of different opinions and the way we should argue out the pros and cons of anything was just shafted aside. Uh, could I ask the speaker, what is his opinion about how we dealt with the epidemic when we were first treated in the year 2020, when the death rates were only calculated to be about 5%? Are we going to let an authoritarian uh, authority dictate terms to the entire world in the future? If we are faced with another epidemic where maybe the that rates may be uh, 20, 30, 50 percent. How do we deal with people like this? Okay, so to, to, I, I think it's a very, very important question because I think, um, uh, and of course it depends on, on, on the particular countries or societies because we have very different um, systems of government and governance in place. But I think one thing that was very clear is that um, there was a popular um, demand for people to be locked down originally. Um, but that popular demand, I believe, was akin to mob rule. And um, I think you have to be very, very careful about giving away your civil liberties. And I, however, um, that's what happened. Um, and in some countries, that was abused more than others. So in China, um, it remains the case that um, large swathes of people are locked down. And of course, this is um, this can be seen as as being rather politically convenient for those in power who don't want to um, uh, to, to let people um, out and, and to mix. Now, um, I don't think, though, that um, uh, from a public policy perspective, I don't think in most free societies um, we would see the same responses. I think that um, if if we had another pandemic, and there's there's various pointers that you know we uh, we may see that. 
I think people will largely uh, look to themselves to, to make decisions as to whether or not they, um, they can and cannot uh, sort of go out and engage in the world. And indeed, I think we saw that uh, in terms of how many countries dealt with the pandemic. So those in uh, the richer developed countries locked themselves down and of course could provide uh, their people with enough money and medication for, for them to ride the pandemic out. And in, uh, in, in many, many places um, uh, where, which were a lot poorer, um, these, these lockdowns were never going to, um, going to happen because there weren't the economic uh, structures around them. To, uh, to to support such lockdown, uh, I, I don't know if I uh, responded to all parts of your question. Your answer is totally acceptable. In fact, most of what you said just now uh, and how you said it was, I'm in total agreement. It is just that how easy it was for those principles to be simply certified. Uh, it disappointed me greatly. And, and i like to see, uh, do we have a plan for the future? Would you be able to say, how should we tackle similar situations in the future in the interest of maintaining academic uh, freedom, the ability to, uh, to take a contrary view? Mm. Well, I think, I think this is um, something that um, we've seen be very, very difficult to get right um, because we've seen, uh, for example, with the with the situation in the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, as the head of an academic organization, I've been contacted uh, by 20, 30 different people um, asking that we we take a position on the war in the Ukraine, and we don't. And the reason we don't is because we don't take positions on any given thing. We don't get we take don't take a, a position on whether we think the Beatles are better than the Rolling Stones, or um, what, what's what's the best football team. We don't take those positions. It's not up to us as an organisation to take those positions. However, we do wish for people to be able to um, express themselves and talk things through, and there have been, I think, very, very worrying signs within um, what, what I posit as the Western Academy, particularly led by the United States, um, to uh, wish to shut down uh, dissent in a way that is that comes from a very, very different place than uh, that shutting down of dissent uh, in, in China. But in actual fact, ideologically, if you look at it, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty similar in the end. It's pretty rigid. It's essentially there's an ideology, there's a doxa, and if you're not following that ideology or if you're not signing up to it, then um, then you're going to be in trouble. And one last point is that such concepts as freedom or peace are very, very difficult to um, properly outline. It's only really in their opposites or in their absence that you understand what they are. So I think um, it's uh, these these are these rights that we have and these freedoms. They are very very um, they're very very dear to us, and we should be very wary of anyone taking those away uh, for our in inverted commas for our own good. Uh, thank you, Prof. Kaldi. Uh, I'm sure uh, these are very uh, pertinent and interesting points which we could go on about. And nevertheless, I think uh, we should take into account that we have run past our time limits and we are eating into uh, the next session's time. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Haldin and the participants. Uh, we'll close this session uh, uh, at this point in time. And I'm Thank sure you, you all can keep in touch or emails and uh, whatever else. Thank you. Bye bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye Thank, bye. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. For the students, uh, students, you can go back to the track one.
of the, Uni of the United Nations University for Peace, established by the United Nations 43 years ago, and the very center for European um, uh, ECPD that I'm representing here today and that all of these professors um, are also um, happy to join, is in fact um, 40 years old. And in the next year, I hope that together with Perdana University as our trusted and dear partner, we will be able to celebrate our 40th anniversary jubilee. Um, we have been to, to Malaysia recently and we have met with your highly esteemed vice chancellor, with Professor Vali, with Madame Zalina, and uh, we are really uh, very enthusiastic about this global cooperation. And we are thankful to the new technologies also that enable you to include us, even though we are on the other end of the world. Um, let me just say a few words about the two professors that I'm stepping in for this morning, this afternoon. Um, Professor Dr. Uh, H. James Burks is one of the greatest cultural anthropologists uh, of today's world. Um, he is not only a professor at ECPD, United Nations University, he is also a distinguished visiting professor of the University of Belgrade in Serbia. He is also a professor in uh, the United States at Canisius College at SUNY. Um, at, he has been a visiting professor at Harvard, at Cambridge, and many other universities. He is also the author and then the editor of the five volume um, world class history of anthropology uh, published by Sage. And Sage is so renowned as, as a publisher. And then um, the two volume um, Encyclopedia of Anthropology in the 21st Century, also by Sage. And then finally, something that I find personally most interesting, and that is the Encyclopedia of Time, which is a remarkable work that connects the East and the West and um, testifies um, to this new unity of science that started about a hundred years ago, um, in fact, um, from 1920s, uh, we, we have been uh, working very ardently um, on discovering or rediscovering these bridges, intellectual and scientific bridges between the East and the West. And um, if, if you would just like to think of this 1924 book, uh, by Niels Bohr, a great physicist, which has a yin and yang symbol on the cover. So it was since Niels Bohr that all sciences started uniting. So this German model of um, decomposition um, into little um, pieces of knowledge, this reductionism has started to reverse and we have started to integrate all academic fields from physics to anthropology, to biology, to history, to cultural history, to cultural studies, economics and law and politics included, and also to recognize the Eastern origins of many of these ideas that have traveled westwards down the Silk Roads and then came back eastwards at the time of modernization after the second half of the 19th century. So Professor Burks is such a figure. He is a cultural anthropologist who is also a philosopher, a biologist. He worked for a very long time um, with uh, Professor Berute Zaldicus on the Galapagos, Galapagos Islands, studying the orangutans as our closest relatives. And he is a great expert on the evolution theories um, and has prepared this talk today together with Professor Branko Milicic in order to integrate our outlook on the importance of education. And Professor Branko Milicic is a researcher who works under the guidance of Professor James Burks. And he's also an artist and he gives an artistic perspective 
um, to the whole uh, importance of education, because when we want to educate, we have to impress upon the new generations the holistic beauty of our research and the importance of education as a holistic phenomenon. So please now, having introduced professors, um, I would like to, to read uh, what they would like to say um, to the audience today. And of course, there will be many other opportunities because um, they express the desire to join your great conference next year. And of course, so would all of us like to do. So um, professors um, Burks and Milicic say, in preparing humankind for its future on the earth, as well as elsewhere in the universe, a modern scientific and philosophical education is necessary. And it needs to be emphasized that these two quintessential orientations, first, a cosmic perspective and the evolution framework, secondly, have to be recognized as such an outlook which understands and recognizes the value of established facts, rational concepts, and an open-ended naturalist worldview. The comprehensive education that we have in mind will enhance our species as it continues both to thrive on this planet and to venture to the distant stars. An enlightened individual needs to be familiar with the quintessential ideas and groundbreaking perspectives of those major thinkers in the recent past, recent in the sense of the biological history of the world, Giordano Bruno, Charles Darwin, Friedrich Nietzsche, and Albert Einstein, as well as many others. Very important are the new conceptions of space, time, and change. These conceptions converge in the dynamic framework of cosmic evolution, within which our species has emerged as a recent event. Furthermore, education must stress the ongoing value of open inquiry. Each of the five bold thinkers mentioned above had both the luxury of time and the creative intellect to reflect rigorously on the place that our human animal occupies within material reality. With dynamic integrity, each of these thinkers had the courage to challenge both entrenched ideas and outmoded perspectives in the light of new knowledge and widening experience. No doubt in the future, new theories will be presented as scientists and philosophers continue to investigate reality with the will to evolve and the use of human engineering for emerging teleology, our distant descendants as Homo Puturensis will continue to evolve into cosmic overbeings, the result of exoevolution. Even so, ongoing education among the stars will have had its ancient origin with Aristotle, the great naturalist who founded the Lyceum, a peripathetic school near Athens in Greece. Our future outer space professors and students will continue his noble and exemplary dedication to education. This is what Professor James Burks would like to convey to all of us. And I thank you very, very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Liliana. 
um, I have uh, actually have no opportunity to mention just now your yeah, participation in Perdana University is uh, on a very auspicious day of first day of Malaysian government. Okay. <laughs> I congratulate you. I congratulate you. All right. On and this, then I, we, we were in Malaysia just, uh, we left Malaysia just as the um, elections were being prepared for the next day. So we just left on Saturday night early um, um yeah. late in the evening and you had elections on sunday so yeah we feel <laughs> I, we feel <laughs> um, um that we shared the common uh, yeah. uh, experience with uh, our dear malaysian friends and people thank you from Liliana. It, it's so nice yeah. to see the your, your guiding principle the cpd guiding principle through peace to development and through development to peace. It's actually resonates very well on this one day of uh, Malaysia new government. So thank you very thank much for you. your participation. Uh, please convey our gratitude and thanks to our Professor H. James Briggs and Professor Branko. I, I love the idea of you know combining science and art. So yes. because uh, when I grew up, when I was actually studying, they always say, if you're clever, you do science. If you're not so clever, you do art. So those, those, were, those were the time. But uh, I guess that is not true because when you combine those two aspects, the, the same thing that I mentioned in the paper, quanti, quintessential. Quintessence, yes, <laughs> quintessential. Sorry, yeah. quintessential. Yes, yeah, quintessential is actually the most perfect thing. It's actually when you have everything. So you cannot segregate whether it's science, yes. whether it's anthropology, whether it's human. So if yes. you know all, so you will be a better. And we also have our here for the medical point of view, we always say a good doctor is a doctor who never stops learning. So it doesn't yes. stop with your MBBS or with your MD. So continuous learning because everything is evolved. And uh, hopefully our students will actually catch another cosmic and another yes. universe to be a better uh, student. Okay, I think we have time. If uh, anybody from the floor sure. would like to ask a question. So far, I think there is no question, Prof. But uh, if anybody wants to say anything, there is still time. Um, may I may I just add that Professor James Burks um, will have um, a one week short course, a series of lectures okay. um, on this on this topic um, on the education in the twenty first century and beyond um, at um, the ECPD platform. And this will be, please have a look at our website. Yep. Um, this will be in February, after right. February the 15th of 2023 of next year. Okay. And um, please encourage your colleagues and your students to participate um, because Professor Burks is a wonderful lecturer and I'm sure you will enjoy his very holistic ideas. And he's um, welcome he's, to see our orang utan here in Malaysia, Prof. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> he was actually, he had been invited because we had um, a great ceremony, the promotion of our first 14 master students in Malaysia. And he was invited, but he had an operation in August oh, so uh, here in Belgrade. And uh, he went back to the United States and he was recovering. So he said that he would join us only online. But um, this morning, unfortunately, Branco, who was supposed to stand for him, could not even join us online. So Professor Burks is really very, very eager to join us, to come to Malaysia, not only to see the orangutans, but to see this wonderful bustling cooperation that we are developing and um, to join in all activities. His recovery is on the way, and I trust he will be able to share um, yeah. his thoughts with all of you, uh, dear and highly esteemed colleagues. Yeah, we wish a uh, good help for Professor Briggs. Um, thank you. Okay. Thank um, you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, maybe we move on, to the, move on to the second section. Um, of the second, Yeah, the second section is by Prof. Uh, Andrew Smith. Um, he has actually uh, sent us his uh, video, actually, um, yeah, uh, our admin would play for our audience. Um, yes. He's talking Please. about the role of library uh, advocacy in the online age. Uh, thank you very much. Nirmala, thank can you, you share? 
Can you share the yeah. screen and, and play yeah. the video? Now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you for your kind invitation to join you today with my talk on the role of library advocacy in the online age. My name is Andrew Smith. I teach in the School of Library and Information Management at Emporia State University in Kansas in the United States. The presentation today will look at library assumptions. We will talk some about the role of the, of the library and librarians. We will discuss what really is available online. We will look at libraries and education, including the idea of multiple literacies. We will discuss briefly some problems and therefore opportunities in libraries. And then I will look at the implications for library advocacy of what I have led up to that point. So let's begin. What are the library assumptions? I maintain there are three library assumptions that limit library advocacy. The first one is that everybody knows what a library is. And everyone will tell you a library is a place with books. Everybody knows what a librarian does. We all know a librarian stamps books. And everybody understands the value a library brings to its community. It's a good thing. All three of these assumptions are completely false and lure librarians into a false sense of security of thinking that because everybody knows what a library is, everybody knows what a librarian does, and everybody understands the value of a library, advocacy is not necessary. Nothing could be further from the truth. So let's look, what is a library rather than a place with books? I like to describe a library as an institution that brings people and information together. People, information together. That is what a library is. It also means that by my definition, librarians are not doing anything different today than they have always done. They are bringing people and information together. We maybe use some different tools. We employ some different methods. But at its heart, a library is an institution that brings people and information together. And what does a librarian therefore do? Rather than a person who stamps books, a librarian is a skilled information professional who understands the structure, organization, and life cycle of information and uses these skills to assist users in obtaining relevant and accurate answers to their queries. Emphasis on relevant and accurate. And what then is the value a library brings to its community? Rather than simply being a good thing, a library provides essential materials and services to enable all users to reach their full potential to the benefit of themselves and the whole community. Libraries serve from cradle to grave. They are the foundations of early literacy upon which all education depends. They support education in all its stages through specialized libraries, school libraries, university libraries. They support business development and innovation and they enable lifelong learning. Therefore, they are an essential ingredient in successful healthy communities because they are totally invested in the people of those communities. Now, what really is online? For 20 years now and longer, we have been told we don't need libraries because everything is online. This is false. It is as false today as it was 20 years ago. The size of the World Wide Web disguises the limitations. There are billions of pages on the web. 
and anyone can publish. There are no quality controls. So there is excellent, accurate content. There is absolute rubbish on the internet, but any, and it all looks the same. Pages come and pages go and URLs change so that access to information, even if it is still there, can be hard to maintain. The next point is everything isn't freely available on online. First of all, everything isn't online. Huge amounts of information remain undigitized. Some of this because of cost. It costs time and money to effect good digitization. It costs money to store that information. It costs money to create and maintain an interface to allow access to that information. There is also information that the creators or owners do not wish to be digitized and freely available online for concerns over privacy, concerns over other things. And the other thing is, even if something is online, it isn't necessarily free. An awful lot of information is behind paywalls, and that includes scholarly information to which we um, subscribe or which we try to use. The majority of that is behind a paywall. It is not freely available. Next question, what is indexed and how is it indexed? Everything on the web is not indexed by the search engines. Earlier estimates from 10 years ago suggest that the largest um, search engines have at best indexed 10 to 15% of what is freely available content on the web, not behind paywall, freely available 10 to 15%. Statistics are necessarily hard to come by because this is a moving target. Um, first of all, the size of the web increases exponentially, but it is also not in the best interests of search engines to declare how little access they actually provide. If at the most generous estimate, they have indexed 15% of freely available content, that means 85% of freely available content is not going to show up in their search engines. Next thing, word indexing by artificial intelligence is not necessarily the most useful index for us to have. It will include references to words that it cannot differentiate whether words are synonyms, whether words are actually about the content, whether the page is about the content, it's doing word counts, not the best way. We also don't know what the search algorithms are that are being used to retrieve information. Naturally, the search engines treat that as um, private information because that is, gives them their competitive advantage. But we also then, as users, have no idea what criteria are being used to select information sources to answer our questions. Very different from how a librarian will retrieve information and provide that information. The other thing is 10 million hits is not a good search result. Nobody can do anything with that. It is not a search result. It is simply an enormous collection of resources. We need librarians to get us to accurate information. So, what about multiple literacies and education? Traditional literacy, we have understood to be reading, writing, and numeracy. But multiple literacies are now required for effective information seeking, retrieval, and use. Mackie and Jacobson first looked at information literacy and described it as a meta literacy in 2011, describing it as requiring component parts media literacy, digital literacy, visual literacy, cyber literacy, and what they termed information fluency. All of these components now are necessary for people to be good users of information. Libraries have always played a role in fostering traditional literacy skills, but they are now expanding their outlook to provide education in and support for the development of information literacy as a meta literacy. This is another area where we need to be educating people in what we do. 
there are some problems and opportunities. One of the major problems we see is the commercialization of information. For libraries, that is epitomized by the serials crisis, which over the last 20 years has seen the price of academic journals, for example, rising much more quickly than the rate of inflation. And often, in multiples of 10 or 100 more than the rate of inflation, which has meant that many libraries simply have to drop subscriptions, provide less access, because the cost of providing access is becoming prohibitive. The commercialization of information also has effect on search result placement. Results in searches are based on the benefit to the search engine rather than providing the best answer to the information need. Another difference between an online search engine and a librarian. Open access publishing provides one opportunity for us to provide free and equitable access to information. And it is growing in importance. POR and colleagues looked in 2018 at the latest figures from 2015 and estimated 28% of scholarly literature amounting to some 19 million articles was now open access. However, there are still barriers. University promotion and tenure policies very often provide barriers to open access, not understanding what it is and so disregarding it. And there is also the exploitation of academics by commercial publishers who are requiring additional payment to make publications open access, which of course is not really open access. So what are the implications for library advocacy? It is more important now than ever before. Few people understand the information they use. They don't understand its origin, its structure, the impact of commercialization on what is available, how it is indexed and how it is retrieved by the retrieval algorithms. They don't really understand misinformation, information that is merely inaccurate, or disinformation, information that is deliberately inaccurate. So librarians and libraries must devote more time to educating people in what a library really is, what a librarian does and can do for them, the value a library brings to its community and the importance of accurate, unbiased information that directly fills their information need. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Andrew Good afternoon, Smith. colleagues. Thank you for your kind invitation to join you today with my talk on the role of library advocacy in the online age. My name is Andrew Smith. I teach. Okay, um, I think there was a repetition, Nirmala, was it? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So lovely, uh, you know, uh, paper and um, talk about the library by Professor Andrew Smith. Um, I hope the students here would understand I think one um, um, important message that I get from that paper is about commercialization of information, which I guess uh, our students nowadays, even for us adults, has been like drowning in effect. Uh, we used to see, uh, I think, Prof. Liliana, maybe you can actually concur with me. Yes. We used to say, seeing is believing those times. Yes. <laughs> may, may, I just, may I just be allowed one sentence, please? Yes, please. Yeah. I would like to ask you kindly to refer back to my keynote speech and to understand everything that Professor Andrew Smith has said as the so-called periphery of the panopticon of the new learner autonomy principles of education. In fact, this panopticon makes up the library role and the library space. We never could realize um, the new learner autonomy principle of teaching in the 21st century without the mighty role of our libraries as Professor Andrew Smith wonderfully described. 
So please join yes. with my yes. paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very enlightening, actually. We never actually thought a uh, library can be a place that, you know, it actually mix, uh, connects people. Uh, because so when we went to the library, normally everything we say, Shh, do not talk. Right. <laughs> so this is a, a yes. very nice perspective. Uh, please convey our uh, gratitude and thank you to Professor uh, Andrew. So I think I will, our next... I will so. Yes, thank you. Our next speaker is already here, ready, uh, Dr. Zheng Zizhou. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Dr. Zheng. Uh, Associate oh. Professor Dr. Zheng, yeah, uh, from Ratna Kosin International College of Creative Entrepreneurship, Raja Mangala University of Technology, Ratna Kosin. Uh, this is quite close to our country, which is uh, just uh, up there in Thailand. So um, our next speaker is going to talk about um, Cloud Notes, a systematic review and future direction. Uh, uh, co writer with Dr. Uh, Professor Zhao Hui. Uh, so, Professor um, Dr. Zeng, you have 13 minutes to talk about your paper, and then uh, we'll have two minutes uh, question and answer. I leave the floor to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I must uh, introduce myself because I have a very good relationship with Malaysia because I graduated, my degree graduated in the UCSI University, Damakona Chichiras, you know, so, and also my master and my PhD graduated in Lincoln University of Creative Technology. So I lived in, I lived in Malaysia more than 10 years, you know, so I'm very, so it's a great honor for me can, you know, be the presenter in the, Pradana um, University Conference. So I really thanks to the Professor Wally invited me to this great, you know, the conference. So yeah. So first of all, I must introduce my uh, the paper title. So my paper title is the Cloud Notes uh, Systematic Review and the Future Direction. So, um, uh, so first of first of all, I must say because I I'm working in a, a university in Thailand and also. Uh, one in Thailand, another in China. So yeah, so this time because me and th this topic is me and my students, uh, Zhou Hui, we do this together because uh, her major is about the cloud nodes. So I also feel, wow, that is interesting for me. So we do it together for the cloud nodes, uh, 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 systematic review and the future directions. So for this paper, for uh, we have the four chapters. One is introduction uh, and uh, research masters, literature review and conclusion. So first of all is the is introduction. So what is cloud nodes? So actually, the cloud nodes is an important tool for personal knowledge management. As a new field, the uh, theoretical system of cloud nodes survives is not perfect. It's not hundred percent perfect. So this study, you know, uh, systematically reviewed the, the literature on similar expression of cloud nodes and cloud nodes, and uh, proposed the, the following five research questions. So we have five questions for this paper, including, you know, such, la, uh, such as what is the function of cloud nodes and where is the future research direction of cloud nodes? So um, yeah, the chapter two is the research methods. So for you, the, this research, we just uh, you know uh, put it the keywords like uh, cloud nodes, uh, every node, one node, digital node, and also you know uh, like the electronic nodes and uh, you know, something like that. And we use the web of uh, science and the CNKI. It's like the one is from China, it's the, the Chinese Mandarin, and also like uh, uh, scars, you know. So we do this research. So um, after that, you know, for the results, the distribution, so there were 60, actually only 68 core articles, including seven conference, only seven conference papers. 45 academic journals papers and 16 uh, decisions. So the literature was mainly collected after 2005. So that one is very, very new field, you know, and no literature before 2005. So you can see the 2005 is just one, 2007, 
zero, 2008, one, and you know, until the uh, 2018, 19, 20, seven, five, five, and this, uh, you know, the two years, uh, last year and this year, only two and three in the world, you know, in the world. So that's why this is very, very new. And uh, for the research methods, so for the uh, the main uh, sources, the conference papers are mainly from the 46 uh, Hawaii International Conference on System uh, Society, Society, you know, and to the 80s International Conference on Information Technical in Medicine and Education International Conference on Cloud Computing and Information uh, Science and the 15th and the 16th uh, annual uh, academy conference of the China Association for Computer uh, Assisted Education. Just to, you know, just like three, four, the conference, international conference, we talk about this topic and uh, some, you know, the journal papers and uh, the, uh, you know, like the dissertations, you know, just a, a few about that, you know. So, for the literature review. So first one is the definition. So for the definition, the exp expression of the crowd nodes, including, you know, like the digital nodes, digital tools, and the digital information management tools, something like the cloud nodes software, and cloud nodes system, cloud nodes, and uh, cloud computing application, you know, just uh, a few, the scholars and researchers the talk about this one, talk about the experience of the crowd knows. So actually, although the exploration are different, scholars have the same understanding of this kind of concept. You know, so the suggestion of this paper, Lee 2018 thinks that crowd knows, you know, same like crowd computing plus digital knows. And JA 2018 believes that digital nodes are also based on crowd technical. So referring to Li and Jia, this study believes that in the exploration, crowd nodes is more, uh, you know, is more uh, accurate. So for, uh, yes, yeah, also the literature reviews, the definition of crowd nodes. So now there is no clear definition of the concept of crowd notebook. You know, but uh, a few scholars, just a few scholars, have definitely it from the uh, perspective of crowd computing and uh, uh, digitalization. So, like Li 2018, Jia 2018. So, the definition of this study, uh, drawing on the views of the above scholars and uh, combining the characteristics of crowd nodes, this study believes that crowd notebook is a crowd survive that is based on crowd computing technique uh, technology and uh, supported by laptops and the smartphones um, providing users with information recording you know uh, uh, storage and uh, uh, access uh, anytime and we across time across locations across uh, platforms, you know. So yeah, it's also, this one is the uh, lecture review about the uh, class fiction. So actually there are many classification based on um, electronic nodes, but uh, crowd nodes are a new stage in the development of digital nodes. So like the Joe 2014, Yao 2000, uh, 19, the Chinese scholars from China, the, uh, you know, talk about this topic. And uh, yeah, next one is the effects. So including the Yang and Chen 2013, Law 2013, Li 2015, and Yao 2019. So we got the summary about crowd nodes. So the crowd nodes have three incomparable advantages over traditional nodes. So what is different between the crowd nodes and traditional nodes? Yeah, it's like, you know, such as crowd nodes can overcome time and space um, constraints and record and uh, store information anytime and anywhere. Uh, 
crowd nodes um, can share their own nodes with others, collect others' nodes, and communicate with multiple users at the same time, which is um, conducive to developing thinking. Crowd nodes is based on crowd uh, uh, storage and has a powerful cloud storage platform. It can safely and quickly, you know, safely and quickly back up data in the cloud anytime, anywhere, and never lose data, you know, never lose data. So for the research uh, studios, so um, from this research content, the current Current research on cloud nodes uh, survives many focus on the four aspects. So the developing history of cloud nodes, the introduction of functional uh, characteristics and uh, uh, usage methods, the application of cloud nodes uh, technology, the system design and the investigation of the use effect of crowd nodes and the research on user um, adoption intention is real. So the for the conclusion and the future research. So actually, um, based on the overview of the crowd node system, so this paper uh, clarifies uh, the expression definition. Uh, classification, uh, role, and research st uh, status of the crowd nodes, and pouring out the development direction of crowd nodes. So actually, me and uh, um, my student, uh, Zhou Hui, we suggest the future research focus on this topic can use not only, actually, you can use more qualitative and qualitative, but you can, it, it's better use the mixed methods, especially use the Quantitative, so we can use a questionnaire to collect more information about the, you know, um, adoption of the crowd nodes from the uh, existing users. Then we hope more and more the scholars and the researchers in the world can focus on this topic because this topic is very popular. I think mm, it's the future topic, yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Zeng. Um, yes, this is a, I, I agree, this is the future topic because um, to my knowledge, I only knew that cloud, we put our information there and, and uh, normally it's actually quite personal and systematic review, yeah, you collect all the study, but uh, when you combine this two, I was thinking, what is cloud in the systematic review and future? <laughs> Thank you for this, this uh, new topic. Um, but I have a few like like questions. Well, if you don't mind me asking you first for anybody else asking questions, Prof Zeng, is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, been a question, but actually for me, this one is also very new for me. So I think for my knowledge is my information. I think I just can, you know, can answer some very foundation, very basic, you know, the answer to, to you, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, no, I, I just intrigued. <laughs> what sort of a content that we can actually um, look for in the cloud? And uh, how are these uh, research, if we have already get the system review, will be utilized in the real world, uh, the research of the study? Um, actually, for these people, we just, uh, uh, talk about the concept and uh, especially about the very, I think it's very, very foundational about this, uh, you know, the, the crowd knows because this one is my, my student, uh, Zhou Hui, you know, her major is about this one. I'm just, uh, because I'm just, uh, my major is management. So I just can help some about something about management with my students, but I uh, must see my student Zhou Hui because um, uh, she's from China. Uh, her English is not really good, so I I just invite uh, you know I I, I invite it. My student can join this great conference. Talk about the more the professional knowledge about this topic. But uh, she told me I'm so sorry because 
for Mandarin it's okay, for English it cannot. I'm so sorry. She said that. <laughs> but I said, oh, it's okay, it's okay. I just help you, Ken, because I, I think I, sh I just want to share this topic to everybody. This is very, very new, and I think it's very, very popular future topic. I because for the research, I just find wow, only 68, only 68 papers about this topic. The you know last 20 years in the world, you know I think it's not really good. So I just want to share this topic to everybody. I hope more and more the scholars and uh, researchers, even you know like the master students. PhD students can focus on this topic, and we do this topic together in the future. I, yeah, I believe more and more the papers, you know, can about the crowds uh, knows, yeah, you know, in the world, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure, I'm sure the, uh, our IT students and, uh, you know, uh, the more IT savvy uh, kids or uh, students nowadays probably will take up, and then you'll be surprised by next year, from 68 become probably 1000. So let's see. So uh, is there any question so far in the chat box? No. Okay. So with that, uh, I thank you, Dr. Professor Zeng Yi Zhao. So mm -hmm. welcome back to Malaysia sometime. Um, now Your that uh, you finished it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. So I will Thank proceed you. to the next um, paper, paper 20. Um, that will be actually by Professor Nebojotsa Radik uh, from University of Cambridge and ECPD, United Kingdom. Um, the paper talk about flexible, adaptable education and the hybrid mode of delivery. Uh, very, are you going well, to talk? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Yeah, I, see I will you now. try to share my desktop. Please. Sorry, bro, I didn't see you there just now. So thank you for joining us. Can you see my desktop? Yep, nice and clear. Yes, we Excellent. can. Very thank well. You. Thank you, Dr. Yanti. Um, um, I will be talking about the flexible, adaptable education and the hybrid mode of delivery. Uh, my name is Nebu Sharadic, and I'm director of the University of Cambridge Language Program. This is the institution-wide program of world languages in the university. Uh, so first of all, we don't see the top. Well, I, I don't, but it's about language teaching and learning. Uh, why am I bringing this to you uh, at the beginning? Because this is a very complex educational activity. If we, those who are not into languages might not realize, but we are not teaching only content, we are teaching four skills like listening, reading, speaking, and writing, which means in technological terms and in real life terms that we need real time synchronous communication. So this obviously represents a challenge in terms of uh, deployment of technology. And this is what I'm talking about uh, today. Uh, now, uh, I have to go back to the COVID uh, COVID uh, emergency period uh, two years ago, because that was obviously a moment when we all moved online and deployed technology on, on a large scale. Uh, so this emergency period ushered the move to remote delivery, to remote delivery, and with it the wealth of technological, methodological, and organizational innovation that has been described in detail in many publications. And I'm bringing to your attention this specific publication because I was the editor in chief of it, uh, with the collaboration of Professor Atabekova from Moscow, Maria Fredi from the University of Pavia in Italy, and Josef Schmid from Chemnitz in Germany. So we put together a collection of 24 studies from 22 universities, 18 different countries of all continents of the world. And what we did was, the aim was to document this emergency period. So what is it that we did during this period? Uh, our next book it will be published in 2024 uh, by CUP Cambridge, Cambridge University Press. And the working title is Responding to Global Challenges in Language Teaching and Learning Developments and Innovations. And this will be an analysis of not only the, the, of the let's call it post-emergency period, 
So now we settled back into the uh, new normal. So what does it mean, new normal in terms of education, in terms of teaching? We, we learned how to teach remotely. We learned how to teach with all these technologies. Uh, but how will that, how does that function today and how will it most importantly function tomorrow in terms of methodology uh, and the application of technology? Uh, one thing that we are focusing on is, and this is very important for languages, but not only for languages, the ways we communicate has changed, obviously, because you see us what we are doing now. <laughs> this has changed. Yes. Uh, and we did the way we use language that leads to changes in teaching and learning. So inevitably, uh, the way we communicate has changed. So our question is, is this the paradigmatic shift in teaching languages, in methodology of teaching anything that we've been waiting for for nearly 30 years since the advent of computers in education? So a standard mode of uh, delivery of courses in languages, at least in the UK, probably in the Western world, is uh, was or is or was blended learning. So here is the definition to the left of blended learning as we know it. Blended learning is the term commonly used to refer to any combination of face-to-face -face teaching with computer technology, online and offline activity materials. So essentially what we do, for instance, in my language program, we don't use textbooks. We use multimedia materials that we produce ourselves. We have a technical uh, section dedicated technical section uh, in so we produce materials in 20 languages we teach face to face in the classroom then students go away and via the vle virtual learning environment which is a moodle in our case they can access materials do their homeworks pre pre prepare uh, for the next lesson in a let's call it uh, flip classroom mode if you like uh, but that is the essentially the blended learning model uh, so then we went to can i remove i don't know if you see my titles do you because i have this strip on top uh online anyway. remote delivery yes, we can. yes yeah remote delivery yeah yes. so yes. during the the emergency period we went to remote delivery uh which was online and remote and it was synchronous using zoom ms teams big blue button okay but essentially comparable tools uh, and the asynchronous portion of this teaching was for individual study facilitated by virtual learning environments. So this was the model that we adopted during, uh, so we moved from blended learning to this remote delivery with technology. Uh, <clears throat> now, I want to, since I have hybrid in the title of my uh, presentation, I would like to just uh, clarify this, the terminology. Hybrid pre-2010 meant actually same as blended learning uh, or distributed learning. So those were three terms uh, used interchangeably. As Petrova here says, a variety of frameworks for distance online and flexible learning have been proposed and among them a hybrid model of flexible delivery. The hybrid model integrates face-to-face -face classes of instructed practical works, online learning environments, and distance learning units. So this is essentially what we just described as blended learning. So what I mean or what today is meant by hybrid is this. Hybrid flexible or, or high flex a pedagogical situation where some students are attending the class and are in face-to-face -face teaching situation, whereas others choose or are compelled by example for instance health considerations to follow the lesson remotely so this is what i'm talking about is a situation where we have a group of students in front of us and another group of students sitting perhaps in their own rooms around the world okay so this is the hybrid situation we are facing uh, now what is hybrid? Hybrid is flexible. It gives flexibility. So one to make one thing clear, I'm not advocating <laughs> the deployment of uh, hybrid teaching, learning, or technology. What I'm saying is that it seems to me inevitable. Uh, it's flexible. Time, space for students of different acquisition rates, learning styles, academic, cultural, personal backgrounds, and the modes of delivery are flexible as well. And to quote uh, Professor Markovic in her keynote speech, learner autonomy is the context where all of this is taking place. 
we are focused on the learner and all of this is to be seen within this context of learner autonomy. We empower the learner by giving them tools, by giving them flexible opportunities to learn. And hybrid can do that uh, probably better than... Uh, so this is one example that we are facing now here in Cambridge. So Cambridge is uh, very, very focused on supervisions, on the personal touch individual, supervision, teaching, face-to-face. -face. We have colleges, we live together, we eat together, we do everything. Uh, so even here, we re I received many emails like this. All my colleagues received these emails. Dear Professor XYZ, I'm in bed with a very bad flu. I tested negative on Corona, but don't feel like mixing with people as this would be responsible for me. At the same time, however, I would hate to miss your class tomorrow. <laughs> would it be possible for you to enable me to follow your class online in real time? Extremely grateful, student ABC. So here, this is a hybrid situation. You say yes, and you will. You can say no today, but not tomorrow. <laughs> just, just think of human rights. Just think of uh, 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 equal uh, opportunities, of accessibility, of disability, of any of these things. So this is uh, the reality. So we need actually to give students access remotely to our classes, and to. Today, tomorrow, we will have to uh, guarantee uh, quality assurance. That that has we we have to give them the same opportunities as the ones who are sitting in front of us. That's a completely different pedagogical uh, challenge. So, what is hybrid learning? To just uh, <clears throat> wrap it up, hybrid learning implements synchronous lessons taught simultaneously in person and online. Okay, so that is the essence of hybrid learning as we are discussing it today. Now, I want to throw in another piece in this puzzle, a lecture recording available via, via the VLE in an asynchronous mode. So we have a, like we are doing now, I don't know if you are recording this presentation, but we are, some people are maybe in the same room, some people are online. And you will record it, so some people will watch it in an asynchronous mode. And that is exactly what our students will be doing. So we have students in front of us, we have students online in real time, synchronously, and we have students who will watch all of that asynchronously. Maybe the same ones, maybe some other ones, but that will be available. So that is the reality of uh, our educational model for this century, I think. <laughs> I, I don't want to say I fear or I believe, or, but you know, it sounds very realistic. Uh, these, uh, this is my bibliography. Uh, so if you need anything also, feel free to contact me. This is my uh, email address, nr236 at cam.ac.uk. So the title was a flexible, adaptable education, the hybrid mode of delivery. And with that, uh, I wish you all the best. It's early morning here. Um, you, it's afternoon for you, but okay. <laughs> thank, oh, thank you, you bro. Thank you. Good morning. I, I should address you as good morning. I thought you are in Malaysia too. Where are you at the moment, bro? Uh, Cambridge. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry uh, to actually not to acknowledge that much earlier, but uh, That's fine. thank That's you fine. so much. Thank you so much for a very wonderful, exciting and relevant topic uh, post-COVID. Exactly. Yeah, a uh, flexible, adaptable education is indeed what we are actually doing at the moment, because even though there's no MCO, the movement control order, uh, some one or two students won't be able to come to the classroom and, uh, with the exact reason what you actually depicted in that letter or email from your student, they will be have to go through five or six days of quarantine. And then what we do, your flexible, um, hybrid flexible classes have to be. Yes, we are ready. We are ready. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess the educators have learned a lot from MCO, from the uh, COVID-19, oh, how to deliver we classes. We had to, we did, because we had to, but we did. <laughs> 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 so a lot of learning process along the way, isn't it? Yes. Even for the educators. So thank you so much. Um, I think the time is actually already 3.32. So we need to go to the other side to reconvene uh, to the workshop.
So I would like to say uh, thank you so much for all our speakers. Um, we'll hope we'll see you again at some other opportunities, professors. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. We will thank see you in the other uh, link. Yeah. Thank yes. you so much. Yes. Thank you.